Hey, it's me again with another fun-filled, exciting story of the old lady next door and me. This one blew my socks off. I've posted about her several times. The hedge, her coming to my door with COVID symptoms, most recently interrogating my nurses. But I have a new one that just happened today. So I'm in my house relaxing after my wound nurse came today. And I hear my ring doorbell go off, so I look at it on the phone and it's a sheriff officer. I tell them just a second and grab my walker and start walking to the door. I open it and have this conversation. Good afternoon, sir. We got a complaint that there is a derelict car parked in front of your house today. So we've come to check it out. But the only car I see in front of your house, he motions to the street, is that white one there, and it looks like it was driven recently. The sheriff tells me, well, not too recently, I'm recovering from surgery, so it's not been driven for a little while, but it is not abandoned. Once I recover, I'll be unit again. Do you know what other vehicle there might have been in front of your house? I haven't seen any. The neighbors across the street have a white SUV, but as you can see, it's not there right now, and they use it all the time. I can't really see the side of my house because there are no windows there, but it might have been there. I don't know. Do you, you have a description? The only thing I was told was it was a brown vehicle that was abandoned and under a tarp. At this point, it dawns on me that he's talking about my 1967 El Camino, which is not in running condition, but it's parked in my driveway. It's under a car cover, not a tarp, but sometimes the wind blows it off. Whenever I notice it, I put it back on. Oh, they might be complaining about my El Camino in the driveway. I'd like to put it in my garage, but I have too much stuff in there. But it's always under the car cover unless the wind blows it off and is never in the street. I saw that, but it's in your driveway and covered completely. Why would someone call to complain about it? I don't know, but that's the only thing I can think of. Let me investigate and I'll get to you. So the sheriff leaves and I see him walk past his vehicle into my neighbor's next door. I go back and sit down. About 10 or so minutes later, I hear the ring on my door again and answer it. It's the sheriff. So I open the door again. Sorry to bother you again, but this has been cleared up. The complainant was talking about your El Camino. I inform them that it's on your property and that it's not violating any laws. I also inform them that it's under a car cover, not a tarp, and it's really none of their business what it's doing there on your property. There is no law here in the county that you can't have a project car in your driveway. I'm guessing that the person who complained was X, the next door neighbor's name. I can't actually tell you who complained, but it sounds like you've had some issues with your next door neighbor in the past. And if this sounds like it would be her, then the odds are you would probably be correct. He then grinned at me and wished me a good evening. Thank you, sir. The funny thing about this is she can't even see the car from her house. It's not that tall and the hedge she so loves is way above the car. The only way she can see it is if she walks in front of my house past the hedge. She is just way too much of a busybody and annoying neighbor. So, some backstory? I live in a third world country. Working here is pretty bad, especially if you work with a bad company. Laws lean heavily in favor of the employer and the ones that punishes them aren't really enforced that well. This started late 2019. I was working as a graphic designer in a pretty bad company. I was their only graphic designer for over two years by that time. I had another colleague, but he left the company before me. And as many small and bad businesses at the time, we were struggling with late salaries. The thing about this company, though, is that not everybody had late salaries. Unfortunately, I had a lot of them. They managed to compile over the years. And by the time it got to six late salaries, I've had enough and decided to do something about it. I was actively looking for another job, but the market was bad. So emailed my employer and told him that I won't be coming to the office anymore. I'll be working from home until they pay me at least half of what they owe me. He said, fine, work from home. After a couple of weeks, I started to slack off. I couldn't find it in me to work anymore. Tasks that used to take me 10 minutes started taking me a couple of hours. So... And after a month or so of this, the manager called me and asked me to come to the office because he needs to talk to me about something. I was like, fine, I'll pass by when I'm free. I went there after a couple of days and we sat and talked. I noticed some graphic designers resumes on his desk, so I got what's going on. He says, I'm sorry to say this, but the CEO said that he had enough of you and he wants me to fire you. I burst out laughing uncontrollably. It's as if I heard the funniest joke ever. When I calmed down, I said, fine by me, give me my money and I'm out of your hair. He then said, fine, we are hiring two new graphic designers and we need you to hand over all the files that have to them. I said, fine, as I wanted to be as professional as possible. One thing that's worth mentioning is that this company had only two computers fit for design work. So I'm entitled to all my bending salaries, a notice period, which is a month since I've been working there for over two years of vacation, ticket salary. Next month, the new designers will come. I will introduce myself and start the process of the handover. Luckily, I'm a pretty organized person. 
especially when it comes to workspace. All my files were well organized, so the handover didn't take more than a week. I stayed for another week teaching them the ropes, since they were new to the workforce and didn't have that much experience in the field. So by the end of the second week, I hand over my computer to the new guy. And then the manager called me and told me to go to the accountant to get my money. When I went there to take my checks, I noticed that it wasn't everything. I knew exactly what I was owed by them and the amount they gave me. Wasn't full. So I asked the accountant, and he said that the manager told him that my notice period is just two weeks. And after doing some calculations, that's the exact amount that was missing. Two weeks of my notice period. Screw that. No, it's a month and I will take every last penny of it. So I stormed to the manager office and told him that I want my money full. He said that since they don't need me anymore, and since the new recruits are good, you don't need to come over anymore, so we'll pay you for two weeks and you may not come next week. I said, no, I will take all the money that you owe me and I am owed a month worth of salary, so I will take it. He said, no, you won't take it unless you come for the full month. I said, it's fine by me. I can come for the whole month. I don't have anything better to do. Remember how they only had two computers and they hired two new designers. So when I came to work on the third week, there was no vacant computer for me to work on. So, well, well. The first two days I was there, I was just watching Netflix and having fun on my phone. After that, I started bringing my Nintendo Switch and its charger with me and playing all day long. Yeah, they were not too happy about it. Spent two weeks of just playing games in the office and watching Netflix and just having fun in general. The CEO came one time and found me actually sleeping on my desk. I am a 43-year-old IT guy divorced with two kids, a nine-year-old girl and a seven-year-old boy. I'm a member of a yacht club and own a small-ish 34 Bavaria cruiser from 2008. Next to my kids, she's my pride and joy. Every year, I take a three weeks vacation along with my kids and we go cruising for the better part of those three weeks. We have a small dinghy that basically serves as our pickup truck slash food hall. Now, because of COVID, we couldn't go anywhere outside our home country. So we said, screw it. We'll be tourists in our own country and went for a cruise to all the small, cozy harbors we normally don't see. So, cruises ago. My son knows about the lines and knows how to dock and whatnot. My daughter is the dingy skipper during this. She loves that thing. We always have our club pennant flying as well as the Jolly Roger. Jolly Roger means kids on board. Come play. We leave our home port and spend a day and night at sea to get the sea legs growing and sharpen up on our boating drills. Tired Navy can't help it. On our third day, we arrived at a small-ish marina, roughly 200 berths. In my country, calling ahead on VHF is not a thing, so the only thing to do is either going in with the boat or sending in the dinghy to spot for a berth. Now, occupied berths are marked with a red sign. Available is a green sign. My kids know this and are also learning to spot a fitting berth. Our boat is three, 60 meters wide, and berths are different in width. So the trick is to spot a berth wider than three. 60, but not wider than 4 meters, because that's the golden difference. Any berth wider than 4 meters costs a ton of money and is meant for bigger boats. Well, well, Captain Dinghy was volunteering, as always, to scout ahead while my son were watching from just outside the inlet. She's equipped with, of course, a life jacket, radio, not the F since that requires a certificate, and a good idea on how wide 3.6 meters really is. Our dinghy happens to be 3.5 meters long, so as long as she can fit the dinghy from end to end between the posts, it fits, including engine. Now, most people that hang around marinas are used to seeing children in dinghies and wouldn't raise an eyebrow over a nine-year-old girl in a small dinghy wearing a life jacket and looking for empty berths. However, not all people are like that, which we would soon find out. She found one and radioed that back saying, I've got one, Daddy. It's a Jeep here and I'm waiting for you here. Over. I reply with good job and route now. Daddy out. The owners of the boats on either side are the caring, nice older couples, and especially the portside neighbors are completely stunned by Captain Dinghy and her professionalism. They're small-talking when we arrive at the berth and help moorings, for which I pay with a cold beer and a soda for the kids. Happy days all around. On the opposite side of the pier, a couple of boats also are flying the Jolly Roger, so the kids are off after a quick lunch. The berth directly opposite us is also available, but knowing from experience that will soon change, and how right I was. Later in the afternoon, we saw the arrival of Karen and her sailing circus. They arrive while the nice grandparents next door and I were discussing nice marinas to visit. And as a matter of course, we stood by to help receive lines and help with mooring. To simplify their docking, it was a crazy show. They had a trimaran, three hulls. The outer two can retract when you dock and extend when you sail. They knew nothing about the boat, so clearly a rental boat. After five or six attempts of docking with one side retracted, other side retracted, no side retracted. 
full power plus screaming all around. The harbor master even came down to join us. Now we stand eight guys plus one harbor master and just look like, what are you doing? Even my seven-year-old son comes by with some new friends and goes, are they for real? Grandma Port quickly provided some ice and soda for the kids. She was amazing. We managed to convince them, the wrecking crew, to throw us the forward lines, and we could pull them in after they retracted both pontoons. This took the better part of one and a half hours. When they finally docked, they acted like they invented boating. I know that docking in a foreign port can be quite difficult, but when you need eight people to help you, one might keep a low profile. Not that couple, though. They were totally clueless about how to get shore power, water, and how to register with the harbor master, who happens to stand right in front of them when they docked. The harbor master is now trying to guide how to register what to do regarding shore power and water. And boy, did they listen. Karen started to yell about how they had paid a lot of money to rent that boat and how they expected harbor fees to be included in the rent and to threaten to report the harbor master to the rental company they used and get him fired for trying to extort money from them. After her endless monologue, there were about eight to ten guys laughing. The harbor master just looked at them and went, okay, these are the rules. Each marina requires a fee for docking. That fee covers power, water, and the space you occupy. It includes access to bathrooms, cooking facilities, and cleaning. Your rental company does not own any marina. Is that clear? The circus husband understood, but failed to convey the last part to Karen, something we found out later the next morning. Next morning, we prepared to go underway. Kids are saying goodbye to their new friends. My son is pampered with cookies from Grandma Port Starboard, broken hearts from the young girls in the marina. He's got blonde hair with curls and green eyes, a heartbreaker. And Captain Ding is getting ready to go underway. She's dressed in the uniform for the part, unicorn PJ pants, swimwear, and life jacket. Here's where the title comes into play. We are finishing our stay, meaning pulling our shore power cable, testing lights and systems, testing our bow thruster and prop, VHF and dinghy. While I'm standing at the stern, ready to single up the line so my curly-haired son will have an easy job, Karen comes running up to me. Karen, what are you doing? Me. Good morning. We'll get underway now. We're going to the island recommended by Grandma Port. Enjoy your stay here. What? What? You can't leave? Um, pretty sure I can. Why wouldn't I? Because we want that boat. What? You want my boat? I laugh at her. Lady, my boat is not for sale. So, excuse me. We have to go. No. All boats are property of rental company X, and we called them yesterday and charted that boat. Now hand it over or else, lady. You're nuts. To my son, clear forward lines. To Captain D, meet up outside the marina, docking starboard side. Now we are not attached to the marina anymore. And my son is rolling up the bow lines when Karen tries to grab the push pit to keep us in the marina. Well, well, she lost that battle. Me, all stop, man overboard. She came up yelling and screaming. Starboard granddad guided her on board their boat and asked her what she was doing. While port granddad called the harbor master. Me, is she okay? Both granddads. Yes, we got her. Enjoy your trip. And we'll see you in Porchy. We leave and head for Port Y. And oh boy, did I hope she was a one-time Karen. We'll call the couple Stu and Barbara. Barbara is a witch, literally. She took up some religion they call themselves witches. Barbara Love bombed a very smart but socially inept friend of mine named Stuart. Stu is super quiet, super smart, actual rocket scientist, and was smitten with Barbara. Barbara was smitten with Stu's house, money, etc. No amount of telling Stu would stop him. He was under Barbara's spell. She moved in with him, took over, cut off all his friends, and gaslighted the hell out of him. Four years later, he sees the light. Time for Barbara to move out. She flat refuses. Stu has a very valuable china collection inherited from his great-grandparents. Barbara has always wanted that china since the royal family somewhere has a set like it. And Stu had to lock it up in a valuable safe since she breaks things when she doesn't get her way. When her eviction notice time was up, we helped pack up Barbara's stuff, stack the boxes in the garage in her parking place, and change the house locks. Stuck around to see Barbara finally get the boot. The evil genius in our bunch got a bright idea. We took a bunch of warning, extremely fragile stickers from my shop, stuck them on the boxes and wrote Stu's China on the boxes with a big black sharpie. Barbara comes out with her sister and another harpy witch friend sees the boxes in the garage and blows up. Argument in the yard, she can't get in the house. She starts losing it when she gets in her SUV. She sees the boxes again, backs up and rams them so hard it broke through the wall into a storage room behind. She's not done. She backs up and rams the boxes wall again. We are already on the phone to police. 
and is caught on home surveillance camera. She rammed her own stuff. The cops weren't amused, wanting to know why boxes were mislabeled. We said we reused the boxes from Stu's original move-in since they were handy. One officer wasn't amused with Barbara, stayed to fill out reports, and actually laughed once it was all over. He's the one that said someone is an evil genius. I wish I'd thought of this in my divorce since his wife burned cut up virtually everything he owned. Barbara has since attempted to break into the garage or house three times in the past two weeks. Police have camera footage. What's left of her stuff was delivered to a storage locker that one month rent was paid on, and no, we didn't rebox any of it. It's in the same state she left it in the garage. Drywall, wood splinters, insulation, and all. Stu is spending a lot of time with us catching up, trading insane ex stories smiling more than I've seen since he met Barbara, and I couldn't care less where Barbara is, and I hope it's awful with her friends barking at the back door constantly. Edit by request for more information. She's the little sister of another guy in my friend group since high school. Every class has a pretty girl in it. Barbara was their pretty girl in the whole high school, and the meanest witch in high school, and spell witch with A-E-B. Think young Pam Anderson before the beehive hair and fake things, but maybe even better looking. Her brother is tall, well-built, naturally light blonde and has statuesque features. Everyone in that family is crazy attractive, but Barbara just won the genetics lottery. The hard partying, selfish lifestyle hasn't treated her well over time, so she doesn't have the visceral effect on everyone she used to. She absolutely could stop everyone in the room in their tracks with gaping mouths in her 20s. But now creeping into her 50s, she barely gets a notice and she hates that that Stu was a bookworm, astronomy, has a doctorate in astrophysics. I don't think he knew girls existed in high school. Way too busy trying to get scholarships to college. Stu plays guitar, has a history degree, has a computer science degree, loves dogs, is absolutely no drama ever, and takes mice outside to release them because he can't be mean or kill anything. Stu's first girlfriend was a little plain when you first met her, but got a lot more attractive the longer you knew her. Just a great person. Ovarian cancer got her about seven years ago. Not long after she was diagnosed... A tumor ate into a major artery and it ruptured. She died quite suddenly, and we rode up that mountain with him. Then he met Barbara, while still heartbroken and lonely. Barbara, on the other hand, has been married a couple times, cheated on those husbands. As a couple kids, she dumped off on the fathers. Was into the crystal gripping hippie new age thing, then went full black magic or something a few years back and declared herself a witch queen or something. We weren't around much since Barbara wouldn't allow it. She's had affairs with two of her family members' husbands and one of the father-in-laws that I know about through her brother, and I don't listen 99s of the time. A string of Deweys for, I think. Drug possession, nothing is ever her fault. Typical narcissist in the textbook sense. Her kids won't see her. Her exes and brother have restraining orders against her. You get the idea. She managed to get her parents' entire estate signed over to her, and had run through about $400,000 of inheritance, was broke when she met Stu again. Still looked like she had money, but was broke to the point of desperation. What's funny, the BMW SUV she rammed her stuff with was a birthday present from Stu a few months back. Now it's all crashed up in the front end to the point the front doors don't want to open. This is the same woman that paid $30,000 for a horse despite nowhere to board it. No experience with horses, just saw it and it was a color she liked. She was trying to keep it in a one-car garage, which she never cleaned when animal control got involved. Some horse rescue place took the animal until it could be sold to a good home, which it did. Sale price was generous according to the people that knew horses in the market. Sale price, $7,000. She paid $30,000 and wouldn't admit she got conned. She had the gall to tell my wife she wasted her life. My wife has two doctorates, an M surgeon and psychology doctorate, works mainly with children and some with disabled veterans, does not pay much compared to high-end plastic surgery, and Barbara thinks working at the VA and Children's Hospital is a waste of time and effort. Barbara says poor people, disabled vets, are losers and shouldn't get what they can't pay for. Never mind, I'm a disabled vet, and I paid for my VIA services with back broken in seven places, lost both knees, one hip, three, four of one lung, shoulder and ankle. I'm an entitled leash on the system. Back surgery is how I met my wife. She helped get my legs working, dropped me as a patent after about four months so she could try dating me. We bonded over bringing the hospital kids out to spend time on my farm. So as you might guess, I'm not on Team Barbara. Her brother, Ron, is the best guy you would ever want to meet, hardworking, family-oriented, honest as the day is long, while women throw themselves at him from all direction. It's actually funny. The only person in the world he's romantically interested in is his wife, doesn't even acknowledge there are other women in the world interested in him. She's a great person, too. Has her own business, is a super mom, helps my wife with the foster at-risk kids groups, etc. Barbara hates her brother's wife. 
calls her Ms. Perfect, if it's Mrs. Perfect, actually pretty accurate. And is constantly spreading rumors she's cheating, stealing money, etc. We all think it's a narcissistic projection. For the first time in about five years, Barbara is no contact. And while discussing this, we all feel there is a huge weight lifted. We'll see how our luck holds. First off, I really, really like small women. Part of it is my mom and a number of the women in my family are short. And if I can find a woman who can even slightly compare to my mom, I will be the luckiest man on earth and live up to the Lilo and stitch line tiny, but fierce. The story, about 10, 15 years ago, I was in college in F.D. Lauderdale, made spring break fun easy to have. So I decided to go down to the beach to do some photography homework. I ended up finishing near a bar a friend of mine worked at who told me about a nice scotch they had at the bar. So I got a glass, went across the street to sit on the wave wall, drink my scotch, and read my book. After about an hour or so, I was finishing my scotch and thinking of heading out. A very lovely young lady approached and sat down beside me. Now, to let you all understand, let me describe her. She was about 5'3", long red hair, petite, and really pretty. Her whole outfit, makeup, and look didn't scream children at all. We got talking, and I decided to hang out a bit longer to see how things would go. After a bit, I offered to grab us some drinks, but when she asked for a day query, I figured to cover myself and asked if she had some ID as she was young looking enough to get me in trouble if I didn't check. So she pulled out an ID saying she had turned 20 one last month and handed it over to show the bartender. I came back about 15 minutes later with our drinks. The bartender had no problem with the ID, and we continued chatting. But as things kept going and she continued to drink her drink, something started to come off as wrong. I started to think she was underage, but as the ID passed muster with the bartender, I wasn't too worried as the fake I'd was on her if something came up. Enter the entitled people. As we were finishing our drinks, up walks a couple. Couldn't be more stereotypical tourists if they had actually used that white stuff on their noses and approaches the girl. Hey, honey, where did you go? We've been looking everywhere for you, the lady told her. The man, seeing the ubiquitous red solo cup, asked, what's that you're drinking? I don't know. Some sort of strawberry slushy type drink he, pointing at me, got me. The man grabs the cup and sniffs it. This is alcoholic? You gave my daughter an alcoholic drink. How dare you? I am calling the cops? The lady then grabs her daughter by the arm and yanks her behind herself. You jerk! You probably drugged it, didn't you? You'll go directly to jail for giving a 15-year-old a drug drink? Obviously, on hearing that, the pucker factor went to 11. I mean, I knew I did nothing wrong, but still. I tried to explain about the fake ID and was about to get on them about her whole look when I was cut off with, our daughter would never do something like that. She then turns to her daughter and asks, would you, honey? The girl shakes her head no. At this point, I figure discretion is the better part of valor and sit back down, hoping the bartender would remember the ID I showed him. I proceeded to sit and ignore the haranguing they were spewing and wait for the cops. I also noticed what looked like her had dropped in the sand behind the wall. This is important later. A few minutes later, the cop arrived, and it turned out she was a dead friend with me and the bartender, and she had a cop partner with her. The parents, dragging their daughter, immediately rush up to the cops, spinning their tale of how I tried to drug their girl with an alcoholic drink. And when they mention my fake eyed excuse, their daughter actually opens her purse and offers to let them search it. After the cop pulls them aside to get their statement, the cop partner of my friend approaches me with a very conflicted look. We had met a couple of times before and got along good, but this was pretty serious of a situation. Before he even said something, I asked him to lean over the wall and pointed to the fake ID. After he retrieved the ID and examined it, I explained my side of the story. After my explanation, he took a closer look at the girl's whole look, and his eyes nearly popped out of his head at how wrong and tricky it was for a child. The partner pulled my cop friend aside, where they had a brief discussion before they arrested all three of them. The daughter for a fake ID and the parents for child endangerment, I think. We all heard later at the next odd game that they were held for the entire 48 hours had their vacation ruined and ended up with some major fines and a call to their state's DVFs, Department of Children and Family Services. Ever since then, if my spidey sense goes off, I'm out of there. Hope you all enjoyed my weird experience. Of course, there were procedures. Proper paperwork had to be filled out and a valid current state identification or driver's license, a court order, and an evidence voucher was needed. Everything had to match on all of the paperwork. Their full name, address city and state, and a property receipt from the police department. If they came to me with a receipt that said John K. Do, then their identification had to say the same. Not Jack Doe. Not J.Q. Duh. You get it. You get it. 
It was supposed to be a surefire way to make sure that the right person claimed the property in 99. 99.99% of the time, it was money dollars, and our department was entrusted to follow the rules. Well, the supervisor and the department head, let's call them team director and team leader, were both in rare form this particular day during our routine morning meeting when they both had attitudes about everything. It probably had something to do with the fact that they were being applauded for running a tight ship and getting things done. Yeah, right. All they had to do was sign their names to things. The staff did all of the hard work, and yet contradicting everything said between one and the other, and walking around with their chests out like they're God's gifts. And in not so many words, both professing, I'm the boss, I want it done this way, or that way. If I say something, that's the way I want it. Do it, and don't question me. Okay, I thought. And I've asked before at other jobs, are you sure? Really sure? Because I was taught to do just that, give you exactly what you want. And usually people end up not liking it. They both were so nasty in their response that I just smiled at my friend co-worker across the table who shook her head and did a face palm. Why? Why? Because she knows me. Okay. It's on. I'm going to do it your way without question because you two are the boss. At around 11 um, I get a call from the security desk that a visitor had arrived with a property receipt, etc., and wanted to know if I would come and collect them to get the process started. Sure, I'll be down in about 10, 15 minutes, I told them, as I was in the process of counting money and needed to focus. As on any given day, there was around $100,000 in cash on my desk, and I didn't want to put the money back in the safe and start all over. When I finally finished counting the money and went downstairs to collect the visitor, the visitor was clearly agitated. Was I bothered? Kind of... Kind of, but I was secure enough knowing that there were 400 or so officers with guns in the building. So I led the visitor up to my office, had them seated, took their information, and began the process. Except one. The voucher looked old, too. The name on the voucher didn't match the receipt. Three. The receipt nor the voucher matched the court order. And four. Their ID was expired. Alert. 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 Giant red flags waving in the breeze. Everything... Everything that I'd been taught was screaming at me that this was bad and that it was going to end badly. I made the necessary copies for my records of all of the information like always, except this time, two of everything, and actually circled all of the discrepancies in red marker, and then told the visitor that I needed to get the checkbook from another office. It would take a little while to get the signatures, and mine, needed and release of funds, required two other signatures. I first went to my immediate supervisor, team leader, and explained the situation to her. I showed her every single solitary piece of paperwork, pointed out all of what I'd circled, that the information didn't match on any of forms in any way at all. She literally did a quick scan, said it's okay. Do it. Do it. I know that I stood there with my mouth opening and closing with no words coming out for a full two minutes, shaking my head. And in shock before I said, wait, did you really look at what I'm showing you? There's something wrong with all of it. I think it's forgery and fraud about to be committed. Her words were... I said, do it, while pushing all of the paperwork across her desk back to me. Are you sure? Do you want to look at it again? You do realize that I'm supposed to cut a check for $97,000, I asked. I asked, no, it's fine, do it, so that you can get back to your other work. I then told her that I was really uncomfortable completing the transaction and that I wanted to speak to team director about it. And so I walked across the hall, tapped on team director's door, and asked if we could discuss the transaction. Now, mind you, team director is the department head. One of the signatures needed to finalize the paperwork. The other person to sign would be the accounts payable department head. I spread both sets of copies of the papers across his desk and again explained in detail the situation and what was wrong with all of it. At least he took a few more minutes to pour over the paperwork, unlike team leader. And so I thought, okay, he's paying attention. He'll see everything that's wrong with this. He'll make a call downstairs and have a couple of officers up here in no time. Nope. Nope. He literally said, it's all good. Do it. Team director, it's not all good. Please, please look at it all again, I pleaded. Now's a good time to tell everyone that I worked for lawyers for five years straight out of high school. And one of the best things that I've ever learned was what definitely became my lifelong motto. Cover your own behind and don't take the fall for other people. And that mindset has been good to me. Again, I pleaded with team director to look closely at the paperwork. I pointed out all of the discrepancies again. The wrong name, the paper being the wrong color or looking old, the expired state ID, everything. And again, he said, I said, do it. Okay. I thought, this is one of the times when you know for certain that this is going to come back and bite you in the behind. But remember when I said that I worked for lawyers for five years in my earlier career? 
Well, I remembered them always saying signatures are everything. Now, normally the only time I would need signatures are when the checks are actually cut. But this time, I was definitely going to take it, oh, so much further. Back out to the copier I went for one more copy of all of the paperwork. First stop was the supervisor, team leader. Team leader, I need your signature to finish this transaction. Sign and date here, 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 and here. Yes. Everywhere I'd made a notation in red marker. Thank you, and off I went back to team director to get his signature. Sorry to bother you, team director, but I need your signature and date here, 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 and here, here. All the while thinking you two won't be having me accused and arrested for conspiring with a total stranger. With that done, I asked team director one more time. Are you sure that you want me to complete this transaction after everything that I've pointed out, cut a check and send the visitor on his way? Team director never looked up from what he was reading and said yes. So that's what I did. Completed the steps necessary to cut the $90,000 check and send the visitor on his merry way. Three weeks later, all hell broke loose. OP, my office, now? My head has never whipped back and forth so fast in my entire life as they both talked at the same time. Team director beat red and team leader wringing her hand in frustration. Shut the door, team leader said. And then I could barely understand what was being said, but eventually figured out that it was about the transaction and check that I'd written prior. Yeah, we and I say we very, very loosely handed over close to 100 to the wrong person. They handed me a record of everything that was currently happening because of that transaction. The commissioner's memo, the judge's orders. The investigation procedures, the assigned case number and detectives, the names of the bank representatives. I was told that there was an ongoing investigation and I'd be contacted by the bank and detectives shortly. And lastly, that I might be fired. What do you have to say for yourself? Team director asked forcefully while slapping the top of his desk, to which I replied I did what I was supposed to do. I did what I was told to do. Don't you remember signing off on it all? I said matter-of-factly. They both spluttered something to the effect of, I would never... I have an MBA and I've been doing this for 30 years. No, this is your mistake. This is not going to end well for you, etc. I almost burst out laughing because it very much sounded like the teacher from the Charlie Brown cartoons. You know whining, but I was in no way worried. I calmly got up out of the chair that I'd been perched on the edge of, excused myself, walked to my office, picked up my purse and got my desk key out, opened the drawer and pulled out the folder that I had made of that one particular transaction. I had purposely kept it separate from the other copies just in case those papers somehow magically disappeared, since Team Leader was commonly and routinely famous for going through our desks. I walked back to Team Director's office and sat the folder on his desk in front of him and waited. What's this? Team Director asked me. Just open it, I said. He spent more time going through those papers than he had when he should have been paying a hell of a lot more attention three weeks ago. He finally looked across his desk at me with wide eyes, and I just blinked back at him, not saying a word. Team Leader asked, well, what is it? And so he hands her the file, but never takes his eyes off of me. I swear that in that moment, I could hear her gulp loudly. For me, it was an, oh, so you two think that I'm going to take the fall for this one. Moment? No. No. Nope. Nope. Not today. Not tomorrow. Not next month. Not ever. Not ever. And then I waited some more. You could definitely hear a feather drop. The room had gotten so quiet. As I said, I did what I was supposed to do. Just like you two told me. Anything else you need me to clear up? I ask. I ask. Team director and team leader couldn't speak. Neither could find their voices in the moment, so I just quietly left the office, shut the door behind me, and smiled all the way back to my office. What happened with the ongoing investigation, I'll never know. The subject was never brought up again. Hell, I did just what they both told me to do. They're the bosses, right? 